Welcome everybody uh, to this Executive Dean's Lecture. I'm not, however, the Executive Dean. I'm merely the Deputy Executive Dean, which may sound like a contradiction in terms. My name's Jack Reynolds. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the speaker. I'm going to hand over to Professor Norrie Newmark, uh, Director of the Centre for Creative Arts, who's doing important work in establishing the research credentials of art and art practices, which for too long universities have tended to ignore, but you know, Norrie's overturning that trajectory. So Norrie, if you'd come up to the stage and introduce our speaker. Thanks, Jack, and thanks to the faculty for supporting this creative arts lecture. It's my great pleasure to introduce Oron Katz, who will be speaking on the topic, Rethinking Life Through Art. And who better to do this than Oron, who's an artist, researcher, curator, and a leader in the area of biological art. Oron's creative practice actually reaches beyond just the art uh, domain into inspiring other areas, such as design, architecture, ethics, textiles, and food. He's the founding director of Symbiotica, that I'm sure he'll be talking about, which is an artistic research center at the University of Western Australia, and rather uniquely placed as an art center within a science faculty, I guess, or science something department. Um, and he also has had numerous international invitations as a research fellow, visiting scholar, and visiting professor, including Harvard Medical School, Stanford University, and the Royal College of Arts in London. I'll just give a brief introduction so we can quickly turn over to Aron. But as does his arts practice, Aron's talks always surprise, raising unexpected questions and not always providing answers never mind simple answers. His thinking, his thinking through creative arts practice and through public presentations is particularly relevant for the current moment, a post-humanities moment when the humanities, disciplinarity, the human and life itself are in chaos. There's a lot of debate about what post-humanities is, what transdisciplinarity is, what interdisciplinarity is, and I'm not going to go there. But what I would like to say is that for creative practice to work in what Jane Bennett has figured as the generative spaces between the disciplines of arts, humanities, and sciences is actually a very complex matter. I regularly wonder how humanities and science can as disciplines speak to each other in a way that is not about illustrating nor about sitting side by side. How instead can we come face to face with and engage with each other's discourses and practices, recognize them, even if we can't know them? How can we speak across the divides? These are questions that Aron's thinking through creative arts speaks to in provocative ways. So let's welcome him here tonight. Thanks so much, uh, Nori and uh, Latrobe, for inviting me and bringing me all, all the way from across the continent, uh, from Perth. Um, it's it's really a great honor to be here. And um, I think, um, and thanks so much for this uh, very generous uh, introduction. And I think it kind of helps to contextualize what I'll be trying to do with you tonight. Uh, what I'll do with you tonight is uh, I'll start with some kind of a case study to just put it in the, uh, in the mode of uh, what I would then try to deliver, and that's this notion, and you'll suppose, the, suppose you'll hear me saying it over and over again, that we live in a time where our cultural uh, perceptions of life are increasingly lacking a language to deal with what we're starting to know about life through science, but even more importantly, what kind of choices we make, or actually someone else is making on our behalf, in regard to what we're going to do with life. So it'll be a series of kind of uh, provocations that uh, hopefully would put you in this context of realizing that you might not have the language to deal with what I'm going to present to you. 
Uh, so the first case study would actually take about a third of my talk, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the work uh, or the reasons why I'm doing this work and then the work we're doing at Symbiotica. And if we'll have time, I'll talk about a few other projects that I'm involved with. Um, so as you heard, uh, I've been, so, so just to put it in context, I was never been trained as a scientist. So whatever you're going to hear from me today is from a person who never been trained officially as a scientist or a biologist. Uh, but uh, in the year 2000, I found myself as a research fellow in Harvard Medical School, in one of the leading laboratories for a field which is called tissue engineering, which hopefully you'll understand more about uh, as we go through. And uh, throughout this year, together with uh, my collaborator in Azur, we spent uh, the time as researchers within this uh, biological or biomedical research lab trying to develop projects where we were looking at the, the main, the kind of the main research question that we were asking was, can you use living tissue as a medium for artistic expression? And one of the projects we ended up doing was to grow in vitro meat. So basically, to grow meat out of uh, cells as opposed to directly from an animal. Uh, how many of you have seen a couple of months ago, about uh, when it was the 25th of August, there was a, a big splash in the media about this uh, Dutch scientist that claimed to grow the first in vitro burger. You remember that? Yeah. So what I'll be talking, what I'll be telling you today is, is kind of how those things kind of evolved. Uh, because back in the year 2000, Jonathan and myself already grown this uh, small a uh, gooey piece of uh, meat, and uh, this is kind of how it was done. So that's from 2008, actually I was commissioned by uh, the BBC to do it for the documentary, but that's really kind of replicating the stuff, of the kind of work that I've done back in 2000 in Harvard. Um, and then, interesting enough, last, uh, last August, we suddenly seen this thing coming through. And what I'm going to show you is actually a behind the scene, almost a behind the scene, a reflection on what uh, this Dutch scientist did uh, by claiming to, f to do the first burger. Okay, wh what I want you to keep in mind is the similarities and differences between how those two things were staged and, and described. Um, what we know about uh, this burger that Mark Post did was that he actually admitted that he added some other things to the, this in vitro meat. So we know that uh, he put some uh, bread crumbs, uh, bread crumbs, and he also colored the, the, the meat with uh, beetroot juice. So it was an artistic performance. There was very little science in the way it was staged. As we heard from the journalist, it was all very uh, meticulously staged and uh, presented and performed to us as a public. Uh, so from my perspective, it was kind of an interesting collusion between something that I did as an artist, and here I'll take my generic artist hat, and basically something that was done by an artist, forget about it, it was me or someone else, and the way the scientists then choose to kind of emulate it. Which, what's more interesting about it is when I heard about Mark Post's uh, plans doing it, so he was talking about it for the last two years or so, um, I decided to invite him to an event that I organized. So that was before this staging of the uh, uh, eating of the meat that we've seen just now. And this is what happened there. So I decided to do a cook-off. Fiddle calf serum. So I staged the Iron Chef style dinner where I got Mark Post to compete against a philosopher. And I got two artists uh, on each team to assist them uh, to have this cook-off where the secret ingredient was something that uh, the people who are working in this field of uh, in vitro meat rarely tell us, and that's the fact that in order to grow cells in a lab, you still need to feed them with something, and what you feed them with are those, fetal calf serum. So basically, the blood plasma from cows, that, or unborn cows, uh, that are used uh, in around 20% of the nutrients that are being fed to those cells. The lab is not this magical place where you can put cells and they can grow out of thin air. So as a way of uh, enhancing it, but also as a way of kind of dealing with the issues around in vitro meat, I staged this uh, cook-off, and here you can see Mark Post uh, with an artist called Zach Dunfield, who's running the Center for Genomic Astronomy. And I set them against uh, Monica Becker, who's a philosopher, a Polish philosopher, and another artist who's very much engaged in kind of meat politics uh, called uh, John O'Shea from the UK. And Again, just a short video, and I'm sorry about the quality of that video, but uh, that's what we were able to get from the Dutch uh, Electronic Arts mean? Festival. So since then, I ran uh, similar cooking events. Uh, this one is from uh, Norway, and I'm just about to do a special Christmas edition back in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, uh, where we're going to deal with the whole mythology of meat that regenerates. Uh, but as a way of kind of thinking about 
our relationship to the animal other or to the other in general, I think the most intimate relationship one can have with anything which is alive is by consuming it. And, and that was really what drived us as artists to engage with that. It wasn't so much about find, finding a solution to world hunger, uh, but through doing so, we started to learn more and more about what it means to grow meat in such a way. Um, so I, as you've seen, the first time that uh, meat was consumed, well, actually, I haven't seen that yet, uh, the, the first time meat was consumed in such a manner was actually in 2003. When we were doing the research back in Harvard, obviously we couldn't eat the meat that we grown there because it was a biomedical research lab that didn't have a license to grow food. Uh, when I've done this thing with Hudson Blumenthal, as you've, Hudson Blumenthal, as you've seen, uh, the British authorities didn't allow the BBC to uh, let us cook it and eat it. I'm still trying to figure out how Mark Post was able to bypass this law. Uh, I'm quite sure he might be uh, fined, but obviously to do with the publicity that he generated, a 500 uh, pounds fine won't do so much to, to harm it. Uh, but the first time, as far as I know, that anyone uh, consumed this type of meat was back in 2003, when we were invited to show our work, uh, and it was a, basically a durational performance that we titled Disembodied Cuisine, uh, and uh, the gallery over there in Nantes, in, in France, uh, had enough funding to bring us over and to set up a fully functioning lab uh, that also had a dining room, and uh, we were able to grow a small steak and eat it. And again, I'll show you a short documentation of that, and then that will be the end of the videos for a while. So what we've done there, we were really playing on this whole idea of what constitutes foul food. Because it was in France, uh, we knew that French people don't like the idea of engineered foods. We knew that uh, most other cultures don't like the idea of eating frogs. So we combined those two things and we decided to tissue engineer our frog steaks. And they were the first piece of uh, in vitro meat that was ever presented and, and consumed by humans. And as you've seen there, it was, didn't really look very appetizing. Uh, the, the texture was uh, very problematic. We're using this uh, polymer structure that didn't break down completely, so it was like fabric. And the uh, cells themselves, uh, as you heard uh, in the introduction, uh, uh, we didn't exercise them, so the texture of the cells was very much like jelly. So it was very much like jelly on fabric. And as you've seen in the video, I said, if you don't like it, just spit it out, And which a uh, few of the people in the uh, that uh, joined us for the dinner decided to do, which was great for me because then I could collect those bits and show them in the follow-up exhibition called The Remains of Disembodied Cuisine, which had this video documentation plus the bits that were spat out by the audience. So that's kind of, that's a case study. So this is kind of how I do work. And now let's figure out why this type of work is being done. So as an artist who wasn't trained as a biologist, I entered the lab with this idea of seeing if what happens when life becomes a raw material because we see it more and more that life is becoming an object for engineering. Biology is shifting away, and I'll show it shortly. Biology is shifting into this new uh, uh, realm of engineering, moving away from becoming a science that describes us what life is into an attempt to try and control it, an attempt to try and engineer it into different things. And what we're starting to see more and more, that we have those, what I'm starting to refer to now as ontological uh, uh, crisis or, or ontological, or ontological uh, pit holes that the scientists are digging for us without even knowing that. And as artists, we are coming to identify it only for the philosophers to then figure out what to do with that. So what we are trying to identify is that things like living fragments of biological bodies, forms of lab-grown life, require a totally different epistemological and ontological understanding, and by extension, a different taxonomy. Those things fall outside of everything that we knew about life before. And this laminality, uh, of the laminality of this kind of uh, technological approaches to life uh, can lead to a form of fetishism. And we see more and more in ways in which life is being fetishized. The interesting thing, when Mark Post said that he's going to take this piece of burger away to feed his kids, he was lying because what he did was actually plastinite, plastinizing it, and now you have a relic. Now you have this historical moment captured in a plastinizing, a kind of a preserved piece of meat for us to worship, for us to fetishize. And we see more and more of those things, and hopefully if I have time, I'll talk more about it. But back as early as 1895, A.G. Wells already recognized that we, we, or at the time, recognized that we overlooked the fact that life is a raw material, something plastic, something for us to shape and alter. I would claim that now we don't, we don't overlook it any longer. Life is becoming raw material, something's plastic, something for us to shape and alter, for better or for worse. And it's a lot to do with works of the pioneers of this field, like Jacques Laub, that in the late 20, uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was talking about his dream to see biology moving away from becoming uh, from being merely analytical to something which is constructive or engineering biology. 
And actually, the term artificial life was coined to talk about the type of work that he was doing in the early 20th century with biological systems trying to create life from scratch to some extent. He really was debating the whole notion of vitalism that was very prevalent at the time and said, no, life is merely a chemical process. Life is a totally materialistic process. process. We have no time for metaphysics. Let's engineer it. And his follower and one of his greater kind of followers is this guy over here, Craig Venter, that back, he was very much involved with the first, or with the public, private human genome project. And then in 2010, he created what he claimed to be the first self-replicating cells that we had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Craig Venter is going around trying to tell us that life can be replicated, that life can be made out of scratch. He's basically trying to bring a, a Jacques Laub's dream a step further and he's very, he, he has no time for vitalists. But according to Venter, and speaking about fetishization, Venter sees DNA as the all thing that life is. Life is only DNA, everything else is any, try, any attempt to try and focus, and I'm sorry about the, it might be hard to read, but any other attempt to try and focus of other elements of a living structure are what he would perceive to be neo-vitalism. So when he created this life form, this uh, mycoplasma laboratoria, the first life form that really didn't continue the uh, chain of DNA replication, but the DNA was replicated or actually synthesized on a computer and inserted into an empty cell that were, the DNA was removed from it. Interesting enough for us was that he or his marketing people chose to use an extremely metaphysical image to sell it to us as the public. Those two eyes looking back at us. I claim that uh, uh, Craig Venter really wants to be Tyrell from Tyrell Corporation from Blade Runner, uh, but on top of that, this whole choice of images, of metaphysical images, in order to sell us something that is there to kill vitalism is extremely interesting because those eyes are what are missing from the depiction of the golem. The golem is supposedly one of the first stories about life uh, created by humans in the Middle Ages. And here it's always being portrayed as if it doesn't have eyes because it doesn't have the soul. And come Craig Venter with his attempts to kill uh, any metaphysical approaches to life and provide us with those eyes that are missing from the golem. Very strange things are happening. So 19, beginning of the 20th century, 1912, this guy over here, Alexis Carell, finds a way, actually some people found it before him, but kind of managed to systemize a way to maintain living fragments of bodies, of complex bodies, like animals, outside of the body using technological means. Basically the birth of tissue culture. He had a very, uh, famous experiment where he used the chicken embryo cells and was culturing them continuously outside of the body of the chicken for more than 30 years, outside of the body, using artificial means, what one of his contemporaries and colleagues says, a new kind of body in which to grow the cell, this technological body. So what happens if we don't have a way to articulate this marriage between technology and biology? We have those kind of things. Yeah. Anyone's got any idea what that is? Okay. Obviously, those of you who've seen my talks before would know that. Uh, but uh, some of you might have seen it also in other places. This is one of the very first premature baby wards in the United States, in Buffalo, New York, 1901, as part of a, a, a great expedition, exhibition. Um, you see those crowd control rails, and you can see this is another version. This is from New York. The reason why you have those crowd control rails is because it was in the fairgrounds. This is Coney Island. Infant, live, infant incubators with living infants. People would pay tickets to go and see those freaks. And the freaks wasn't just the babies. The freak was this combination between bodies and machines. Those combination between technology and life, if there's no place to articulate it, it goes to the freak show. And even when the medical establishment started to acknowledge the fact that this is actually a life-saving machine, it had about 80 to 85% success rate the place where they would go and buy it was Coney Island. The distributors for uh, the baby incubators were in Coney Island, and it was for sale to hospitals and amusement parks. And in a sense, we see a return of that. We see that quite a lot, that the thing that Mark Post did was for amusement, was very much like a freak show. And the incubators are interesting. I'm actually in the midst of, a, I just wrote an application this morning for a grant where I'm going to Buffalo to stay in the house of the guy who invented the industrial chicken incubator, and I'm trying to figure out if him seeing this show back in 1901 as a kid helped him realize that he can actually create industrial-style 
uh, incubators for chickens. This combination between biomedical research and industrializing bodies is something that I think we have to pay attention. And as uh, John Safran Meyer, uh, Foyer said, uh, and many others said, factory farming, and here I would say it's not just factory farming, it's contemporary biological attempts, consider nature as an obstacle to be overcome. So we're starting to see those problematic areas. And again, something which is actually about to turn 20 is this freak over here. How many of you remember seeing that? Back in 1997. For me, it's one of the most important images of the late 20th century. It was an image that was constructed specifically for public consumption. This is one of the most celebrated scientific failures. The same laboratory that did that is still trying to grow ears. I'm actually going to visit them in March. Still trying to do the very same thing on the back of mice. Obviously not the very same mouse. But they're still trying to do it. But what we've seen back in 1997 was an attempt of those scientists to capture the public imagination in order for us to realize the potential power of those new technologies. And with a direct reference to, science, to art history. So what I find as an artist is that actually one of the most important images of the late 20th century was created with reference to artist, art history, but by a scientist and not by an artist. And that's why I decided to move into this field. And that's why I decided also to set up a lab, because I figured out it's not just myself who is interested in doing so. There's a growing amount of artists who want to figure out how to engage in a most experiential way with what the life science has to offer. Because if life is becoming a raw material, if life is becoming something to be engineered, it's, we shouldn't leave it only to the hands of the engineers. We should show alternative ways in which this new palette of possibilities can be exploited and can be resisted in cases. So we set up Symbiotica back in the year 2000. I started together with Yonat Zur at the School of Anatomy and Human Biology in UWA as, with an artist-initiated res residency back in 1996. But we were lucky enough to actually get funding to build a physical space to start to host artists. And the main thing that we are trying to do is this notion of research, learning, and critique, but through hands-on engagement. We are totally implicated within the biotechnological and the biomedical process and project. We're there doing the very same things that the scientists might be doing, but our motivations, the reasons, and the kind of objects that we are producing are extremely dif dif different. And obviously, um, the way in which we go about it and one of the main things that we constantly remind ourselves is that we're not there to cure cancer. We're trying to shy away from any attempt to uh, instrumentalize the type of work we're doing in this context. Saying that, there's some outcomes that can be exploited and we sometimes give it back to the scientists if they want to, but that's not our main interest. Our main interest is to identify the shifting perceptions of life and we do it through basically reading through scientific literature, trying to figure out what's going on, what areas we feel need the most cultural scrutiny, and we're there to do it. And we do it in order to propose alternative directions. We, we engage in the idea of the contestable. What we're doing is constantly contestable. When I grow a steak, I don't want to tell you that I'm going to feed the world. I want you to contest the notion of growing a steak in a lab. And we do it in order also to reflect the ethical issues. I hope, hopefully, some of you felt un some, somewhat uncomfortable when you saw some of the stuff I was showing you already. This idea that this zone of uncomfort, those areas that we feel need the cultural scrutiny, comes directly from this notion that we don't really have the, the, the tools, the ethical tools, to engage with what we know about life and what we choose to do to life. And as I said, we do it uh, in this idea of embodied knowledge. We're there in the lab doing the work ourselves. So we can talk about it in ways that we explore the philosophical sh shifting perceptions of life. We identify and develop new materials. So if we have, as I said, this new palette, we're there to try and see what kind of new materials can be used for artistic, artistic manipulation. We research the strategies and implication of presenting living arts in different contexts. What it means to take something like that and put it in the gallery. What it means to have a fully functioning lab that grows a steak made out of frog cells within the context of a museum what it means to, and you see so many other projects, what it means to take living, semi-living, partly living, recently living objects and putting them within the context of, within a cultural context, outside of the lab. And that's really a lot of what we're doing is surrounding that. And we also have what we refer to as an enabling technology arm where we are developing technologies and protocols for artistic research and uh, display. So we sometimes build machines, instruments, and technologies that are designed specifically for the needs of the artists. Yeah. And we'll talk about it later a bit as well. 
Uh, but another thing we're doing is also we're going around the world and we hope to build up those mutant clones. So this is Biophilia. This is a research lab that we just established in Finland, in Aalto University. And that's one of the best and the most expensive installations I ever done. It had a budget of about a million euros to set it up. They got strategic funding from the university to do it. We handed them the keys, they ticked the box, and now we're figuring out what to do with it. But our work there is done. It's the best lab I've ever been to. Um, and this is kind of work that we've done. Uh, we'll, give you this, we'll give you an overview of uh, an exhibition that we had back in 2011 that uh, had some of the works developed by artists uh, since the year 2000. So yeah, so this will give you a very short overview. And just in the context, I, I'm really apologizing for the quality of the videos, but as I was seeing that, it kind of struck me that actually that's a really nice metaphor. Quite a lot of what's happening with life at the moment, especially in the field of synthetic biology, is trying to increase efficiency and try to compress things and, and make them work better in human scale. And I was trying to compress those videos and that's what came out. So I, I think it's kind of an interesting when you try to impose our will on things, even when they are just our videos, uh, and, and you get strange things coming through it, and that's through systems that were rationally designed. So what happened when you start to operate with biological systems that never been designed and never been rational? Uh, saying that also, you should be aware that working from within a biological science department, all of the projects that we do at Symbiotica need to be cleared by the ethics committees and the health and safety committees. So for example, the piece with the human skin books, which obviously generates quite a lot of connotations in regard to the use of a uh, human skin within the context of uh, book binding. Um, that was an interesting uh, international precedent where we got f uh, an ethics approval that allowed artists to go and interview patients before they went into an elective surgery and get the patients to consent and agree to donate the surplus tissue, the tissue that was removed from their body specifically for artistic purposes and with the knowledge of that being displayed in public. And now we have uh, many other uh, ethics approvals that are considered to be international precedents that are driving quite a lot of other attempts in other universities in the world to allow artists to engage in such a manner. So that's just a segue. Uh, but what we do at Symbiotica, we have academic courses, we run exhibitions, residencies, symposiums, seminars, and workshops. So we are trying to kind of broaden the, the, uh, the group of people that are engaged in this experiential way uh, with the, the life sciences through those different ways. Um, our residency program is one of the, the biggest things we're doing. We had more than 80 residents, and this kind of taxonomy of areas of research is really kind of just a, an arbitrary breakdown depending on some of the areas of scientific uh, uh, interest that uh, some of our residents had, but I could have broken it in many other different ways. And uh, I, just for because of time, I'll, I'll just kind of really rush through some of those projects. This is a project that involves um, connecting nerve cells which are disembodied to a robotic arm that produces drawings. Uh, this is using a similar system, but now uh, what you see here is a forest of robots, so you start to increase and amplify this culture of, of nerve cells that are growing over an array of electrodes into an arch uh, architecture scale where the movement of the audience in the space is what's used to stimulate those nerve cells. Um, we had a series of uh, residents that came from other disciplines, not necessarily the fine arts or the visual arts. We had uh, geographers, museologists, art historians, science fiction writers. What we're doing, we're opening the doors of the lab to people who are interested in those questions that we raise, uh, but don't have usually access to those resources that are fairly restricted. Uh, what we're able to do in Symbiotica is actually allow uh, our res researchers to have the same treatment and the same access to the laboratories as any other researcher within the science faculty that we are part of. So it's not about asking favors anymore. It's actually about considering our research as valid as all of the other research that takes place in our building. Um, so we make a point that the people who come, even from other disciplines, so we get philosophers and theoreticians, but they must spend time in the lab. They have to do a project that involves this embodied experience of manipulating living systems. Um, we work with plants, we work with ecological systems as well. So this is a project that we developed around Lake Clifton, south of Perth. It has one of the last remaining active colonies of uh, those types of uh, communities of uh, cyanobacteria and other organisms. And basically, for the majority of the history of life on Earth, this is how it looked like. And now there's maybe 10 active sites in the world, five of them are in Western Australia, all of them are being threatened by human activity. And this specific uh, lake, Lake Clifton, is actually on the verge of one of the fastest growing urban development sites in Australia, in Mandra, and it's extremely threatened by reduction of rainwater due to global warming, uh, over pumping of groundwater, and runoff of nutrients from the farmlands around it. So the lake is becoming extremely polluted or extremely uh, uh, 
salty as well, uh, which harms the prospects of those organisms to create and continue creating those structures. Um, <coughs> one of the projects that uh, we developed uh, together with Vion Walker was to try and create the slowest growing sculpture. Those organisms or those structures grow between one millimeter or 0 0.1 millimeter to one millimeter a year. So you can imagine how old those things are. And what Vion was trying to do was to try and grow the slowest growing sculpture that in about 10,000 years would take a shape of something. Uh, a project that I was involved with called the Autotroph was trying to look at this notion of overly engineered um, futility, the attempt that we're trying to throw technology and engineering solutions to problems that were, we created with technology to start with. So this is a desalination fountain that basically collects water from the lake and take it through the solar furnace, uh, steam the water, so the steam of fresh water then is being reintroduced into the lake. It's got about uh, uh, the same efficiency as trying to clean the Black Sea with a Brita filter. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what was interesting with this project as well, I was showing it in the, at the National Art Museum of China in Beijing, and when it came back, all of the screws were loose, which meant that uh, someone was trying to reverse engineer it. So it's really nice to see lakes in China now, hopefully, would be full of those pieces of uh, futile engineering. And actually, it was destroyed in the storm, and I recommissioned the same engineering firm to, to rebuild it because we got the insurance money. And I really liked the phone call from the engineer who said, we actually managed to make it better. I have no idea in what way. Um, things like molecular biology, this is the work of Paul Vanus, an American artist who was hacking into DNA fingerprinting technology and creating recognizable images using the same system that is basically, basically used in the United States and here to throw people to jail and even kill them. And he showed how easily it is to manipulate it. He recently had an exhibition performance where he was able to recreate the DNA evidence against O.J. Simpson using his own DNA, using this system of hacking into DNA uh, Bands. Things like uh, mycology and fashion, Donna Franklin. Uh, here's another work to do with neuroengineering. This is a piece where the artists were basically using a technology which is called IPS, which is induced polypotent stem cells, so basically what is being held as a solution, an ethical solution to stem cell research, where you can take adult cells and convert them into stem cells, embryonic like stem cells, and then redirect them through a different path. And what the artists here were speculating and were trying to do was to take uh, adult or basically take foreskin cells, re-engineer uh, re them to become stem cells, and then uh, redirect them to grow nerve cells, and by that creating a dickhead. Um, they didn't manage to do it so very well, but then they found out that there's a commercial company in Wisconsin in the United States that actually sells those types of things. That they basically take skin, foreskin cells from hospitals and then take them over to the lab and redirect them into nerve cells. So they're able to mail order those cells and those cells were ended up in this installation over here where those cells were then kind of interacting with the audience to some extent. They worked with a sound artist like Ed Hope where, who was recording the sounds of decay. And yeah, okay, hopefully that will come up. Uh, this is a really interesting work by a German artist called uh, Verena Friedrich where she was basically using cells, skin cells, to recreate those types of uh, pseudoscientific statements that are coming up in the, um, let's see if it works, that are, are coming up in the cosmetic industry. Uh, so it, it's a technological fit, actually scientists to see it are quite amazed to see how well she was able to define those cells, so each, uh, each one of those letters is actually in the shape of a cell, or in the size of a, a few cells, you see the width of the cells there, and kept the cells basically spelling those words, uh, but as you can see, and as life operates, the resistance of life always prevail and uh, the messiness occurs. And similar logic is the work of uh, Lauren Kronmeier, Kronmeier, one, one of our students, uh, master students, who was working with uh, social insects, trying to force them to take shapes and basically draw with them and created those uh, amazing videos of, again, uh, those insects kind of resisting the shape that was imposed on them. Um, I suppose I'll just talk about one last project before we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, so the whole field of synthetic biology is something that is quite interesting. We don't hear a lot about it here in Australia, but um, in the rest of the world, it's a huge buzzword. And what it stands for is really about the uh, application of engineering principles to the life sciences. So totally fulfilling the dream of Jack Laub, uh, synthetic biology is really driven by engineers. Most of them have been trained as uh, 
um, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers who really liked the logic and behind a, a simplistic view of uh, the way life operates and uh, trying to impose it again and use uh, engineering mindset to drive uh, contemporary biological research to develop biodevice, biomaterials, biosensors, new drugs and biofuels. Uh, but again, to do with cultural amnesia, as early as 1911, here you see a book by Stefan Leduc, a French scientist who writes a book called The Mechanisms of Life. Chapter 10 is titled Synthetic Biology, where he talks about the move of biology from a field of research and understanding how things are happening to something which is similar. He's actually, he actually was a synthetic chemist, uh, to a field which is similar like, to synthetic chemistry, uh, where you start to synthesize life forms and you start to create uh, life and he was trying to prove by uh, different examples of using um, chemical reactions of varying degrees of complexity that life is merely a chemical process. So here you can see one of his experiments where he talks about it in terms of artificial liquid cells formed by colored drops of concentrated salt solution in a less concentrated salt solution. And you have something that looks very much like living cells, with, even with the nuclear there. Uh, so we decided to join forces with an engineer, called, engineer artist called Cory Van Sais and develop this piece over here, which is basically an homage to Jacques, uh, to uh, Leduc. And uh, we basically then used one of the most hype technologies of our time, which is 3D printing. And we decided to automate the very same protocol that was developed by Leduc in 1911 uh, to bring about those types of synthetic cells. And what's interesting with those cells is that they form very quickly, it's a very simple solution. So it's basically mixing two different types of salt solutions and one of them contains uh, Indian ink. And after about a minute or so, they form those shapes that look very much like cells. But the problem is that uh, after about uh, 10 minutes, the whole thing kind of just degrades and basically entropy takes over. So you can see how they look like. And this is how it ends up. So the life cycle of those cells end up as something like that. And I suppose with this messiness, I would end. And thank you very much. Thanks, Oren. Um, we're opening to questions now, or comments, or disturbances. Because I think Oren's work is really provocative and disturbing and I mean personally I go through a range of emotions when I see it. Um, so yeah, even if you don't have a question. I had uh, one that I, is a comment mm -hmm. and I had a question and the comment was, I'm not sure how the names pronounced, but Guy Benari. Guy Benari, yeah. Guy Benari. I, it's, I find it my comment is I find it really curious mm -hmm. that they were able to mail order that in and get it into Australia and that, that that's just possible. Uh, I'll just let me say something. This is one of the benefits of having a research center within a biological science department. Sometimes we don't so play up the idea that we are artists. We're basically saying we're researchers. We have a research center at the University of Western Australia, the School of Anatomy, Zoology, and Human Biology. It, the, this thing is okay, extremely so expensive. Just, just to put it in context as well, is like those cells and the interesting thing with those cells, they don't uh, they don't divide anymore, so you get them as what's called terminally differentiated. You get a vial, a tiny vial with those nerve cells, and that's all you have to work with. And they have a, if you're really successful, they would live for about a month. Uh, and that's in the thousands of dollars. So it's not a cheap endeavor. So each time staging this piece is actually quite expensive to the people who invite the guy. Yeah. Mm, thank you. My, <coughs> my question kind of comes from, in, in a way, you're talking overall in the coincidental fact that I came here directly from the first day of the four-day Asia-Pacific nanobionics mm -hmm. symposium. And the last thing that occurred today, the last session, was about public engagement. And, and it was like a, a, almost a spa off between scientists and ethicists. Mm. And the different positioning they have and the challenge that they have trying to come to a mutually agreeable ground mm. that can somehow in, engage with the ethics that, as you said, we don't mm. have language for, yeah. we don't have ways to think about yet. And my question is, can, can you perhaps say something about um, the kind of tangible impact that your work has on the scientists that are 
directly exposed to it. I mean, in particular, you, your lab sits within mm. a school yeah. of, of health sciences. And mm. what can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question, and th there's quite a few different levels I can engage with, but to do with the impact on the scientists, it's obvious that the scientists who choose to work with us and those that we're able to seduce are seduced specifically because they feel that something needs to be unpacked there, and they don't have time to do it. Most of them are very focused on the research. It's, you know, there's, uh, I, I work with scientists, I, I think that scientists are thinking people, I think the, the rhetoric of, for example, bringing creativity into science by getting artists is, is the wrong way of going about it, but opening their eyes to, th impact, to the impact of their work by having artists around, uh, questioning what they're doing and showing the, the larger social cultural impact of this type of work is extremely important. So by, by making them aware of the fact that, for example, when, when we've done the in vitro meat project, so when we were research fellows with uh, Joseph Vacanti in this lab, um, when we presented that project in the lab meeting, his eyes opened up and says, I, I never even realized that the technology that I was developing to try and save lives can also be used for this purpose. And now we see scientists are actually doing it. Yeah, so this type of idea, and, and for better or for worse, you know, I'm not putting a, a value judgment on, on that specific project, but I'm basically saying that if we don't have the artists moving in and showing the scientists that actually what they're doing might be contestable, that what they're doing might have uh, other ways in which it can be used, um, we, are, we are failing as well. We really, uh, and, and reminding uh, scientists that what they're doing without them even being aware, is digging those huge ontological holes. And we need to not fill them up, but we need to show them that this is a side effect, this is collateral damage from their research. And I think that in many cases, ethicists don't really have the language to engage with scientists, and artists can act as somewhat as bridges, but also what artists are doing in this very context, and that's why it's so important for us to resist this instrumentalization of art, is the fact that our great government of the day talks about in terms of the frivolity of what we are doing. This is extremely important for us to continue engaging in frivolous activity because this is where we highlight the main issues. This is where we find those holes in the boat. And if without doing it, we're going to find ourselves in an extremely problematic situation where any type of ethical um, argument would be brushed away for the benefit of utility and function of sorts or whatever ideology runs that mindset. So as artists, we, we distill those ethical questions because we, don't, we can never hide behind utility. We can never say that people are dying in the uh, hospitals. We can never say that we're feeding the world. Because you know when Mark Poe stands up there and says, I'm going to feed the world with this meat, that's bullshit. But this sells and this hides any other attempt to question the motivations and the impact of this type of work. When an artist comes up and says, no, I'm not trying to feed the world, I'm trying to question what we're doing, then we might open up the, the discussion in a way which we wouldn't ever be able to do in any other way. Yeah. That's my polemic. Uh, and I think the question of instrumentality is, is, is key. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that back hmm. in. Yeah. Thanks very much, wonderful talk. Hmm. Um, this morning I was reading some of your work on academia and I'm just trying to get a feel for where you're coming from. Mm. And I haven't had anyone to sell Ark, and I noted that part of his work was done in collaboration with you. So I was sitting next to the arm that was, um, sorry, the ear that was on his arm, and this was a bit disorienting. But one of your remarks is that you think there's a significant contrast between what Stellark is trying to do with his performance art of that nature and what you think uh, your group is doing in regard to, well, rather than sort of making a human body cyborg like mm. or transhuman, do you think there's a different uh, emphasis? Yeah. Could you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, again, it's a great question, and I think it touches also on what Nori was saying about kind of this uh, whole notion of the post humanities. Uh, we made a very concise dec decision from the very beginning of our work to try and avoid directly engaging with the human body. So the Stellac project was one anomaly that was actually enabled us to also re-emphasize why we were shying away from doing it. And the reason for that was we're trying to force people to go off the path of less resistance. We already have quite a strong discourse about the engagement with the human within this whole context. Our question is much broader about life. Once you bring it, you know, the only time where blasphemy was actually spelled out in regard to our work was when we've done this project uh, because Obviously, Stellak was done in the image of God. Whoever believes that God is in the image of Stellak has an issue. But, um, 
But the question is, if you are starting to work with the human body as opposed to working with other bodies, why, do, why we need to resort to this path of less resistance and how we can force people away from that. And our solution was to, to kind of avoid, um, even when we work with human tissue, we, we don't really highlight that fact. So when we worked with the, the victimless letter, for example, it was a combination of uh, human and mouse cells growing together in order to uh, highlight the idea of the hybridity, but also highlight the idea that what we're doing is beyond the human. It's really engaging with life on, on all of its different levels. And by trying to avoid the human there, uh, we force the audience to, or, and, and the people who engage with our work to, to rethink uh, their position. And, and that's why our work is not so popular as well. It would be so much easier for us to seduce people by talking only about, you know, in transhumanistic terms, about human enhancement or about the human body. You know, I, I could have shows left, right, and center, but that's, I think this is the easy way out. But of course, um, human bodies are involved in your research because you inhabit such Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, you, you talked a lot about the artists and the engineers um, theories. So you, on the one hand, there are these um, living things that mm -hmm. lack a kind of human nucleus. And on the other hand, there's, there are these figures, the artists and the engineer, mm -hmm. who are all the nucleus whose individuality is um, mm. coherent and um, mm. is in no way jeopardised yeah. by your discourse anyway. So I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, surely your move to reflect on uh, your own flesh and um, the way it is being cultured, perhaps independently of will and that kind of individual force. Can you speak about that or is that yeah, no, it's, it's a great point, but again, I think it's, it's falling into kind of those paths of less resistance. I'm sorry, you know, without insulting you. Um, it, it's obvious that there's something extremely paradoxical in any attempt to be uh, anti-anthropocentric, or we're starting to talk about it more in terms of post-anthropocentric. We inhabit human bodies, we communicate in uh, the, the biggest human technology of them all, and that's our language. We can't avoid it, we can't separate ourselves from there. So we always engage in paradoxical type of attempt to try and remove the human from the equation where we engage with it, and that's something I'm acutely aware of. Um, so saying that, I, I still believe that in a way, first of all, the reason why I chose to be an artist was because I think that I have a license to engage in paradoxes without resolving them. We leave the philosophers and the others to try and to, to deal with this complexity, and this is exactly where, when, when you talk about the engineers and the nucleus of the engineer, the engineering mindset is the total opposition of the artistic mindset, in my opinion. And, and therefore, we need more artists engaged in fields where engineering are kind of taking over, just to be able to highlight this notion of the paradox that we are embodied and, and we are part of, and, and that we can't avoid, and especially when we work with carbon-based life, which we are part of it. So um, in, in this context, it's, and it's obvious that whatever I do is shaped by who I am and what I was shaped into. Um, uh, and it's embedded in, in quite a lot of my writing, so there's quite a major difference between the way I present my art and I talk about it when I write or when I write about it. Um, so all of those things are coming together and, and we can't avoid uh, the, the human, but we can force people into those zones of uncomfort by deliberately trying to engage with things which are falling outside, beyond, or somehow this, or, or linked to the human, but not the human exactly. And that's why when we worked at Stella, for example, the type of discourse that our work generated was extremely disappointing for us in the context of the focus was on Stella and the body in, that, in the way that Stella sells it, which, uh, you know, Stella is a great inspiration to my work, uh, but the notion of the ear as being an object of partial life seemed to be removed. And it was actually just one little story about the year that happened here in Melbourne that when we were, the piece was selected for the Clamager Award, the NGV didn't want to have it. And they were doing all in their power to stop us from showing this work. To such an extent, and, and you know how contemporary museums are, they wouldn't say we censor the work, but would, they would just put more and more administrative kind of uh, blocks to try and stop you from doing it. And they kept on, they even asked us to commit that our work doesn't raise any ethical issues. They asked a letter from whatever they refer to as the biomedical fraternity that they're okay with our work. They were trying to basically stop us in any way or form and in the end, we decided to, the compromise that we had, and there was like a big struggle, the compromise that we had was that we're going to grow Stellux here, but using animal cells. And they were okay with that. Or that was the compromise. 
And from our perspective, actually, it worked so much strong. The work became so much stronger by growing a, a, a human-shaped organ or an, a, a, an object which is shaped after a human organ uh, using animal cells. So if anyone had any ethical issues with that, actually, that might have been even worse. But from their perspective, they felt that that was a good solution. And it kind of really kind of drove, drove it into the type of narrative that we were interested in having as opposed to the human-centric one. So paradox is all over. sort of suggest while people are formulating <laughs> further questions. I mean, that that's, raises for me or makes me think about, you know, your work tends to be exhibited within a certain framework, mm. like bio art or, mm. you know, early on new media, whatever. Like, it feels, it seems that that sort of silo phenomenon mm. in the art world sort of diminishes, it's a pity really, because it diminishes the sorts of conversations mm. that could happen. I, yeah, does uh, that bother you or? It is, to, to, because first of all, we don't really see our work fits very well within what new media is considered to be, you know, especially the digital-based new media. Our, our work is actually uh, quite resisted and we found that the worst places to show our work is in this context because there's a notion of sameness of technology. So. They think that our work has the same type of on-off switch that a computer would have, or a projector would have, uh, and not realizing that life needs totally different types of considerations. Uh, but then this idea of the, the silo in, in the ghetto that we, we find ourselves locked into, it's, it's a problem because it's a way of kind of, okay, those are the weirdos, uh, we leave them in the corner there. That's why I hate the term bio art, I must admit. Uh, and we find that our work is better received and much better treated when we show our work within a traditional context. So we had, uh, we've been fortunate enough to show our work in a few places where it was within kind of more of what can be considered to be uh, mainstream art. And that's where the curators actually have the time to understand what we're trying to do and, and try to push it ahead. Uh, but our work also ends up now in the context of design, so we see, uh, which is also problematic from a different perspective, mm -hmm. uh, but we see more and more of uh, work of this field and our work in particular being driven towards kind of a design discourse and design exhibitions. Uh, but saying that the, the piece that I talked about in the end, the uh, mechanisms of life, at the moment as we speak is in two, uh, we have two versions of it. One is in a synthetic biology show at the Science Gallery in Dublin, so in a very kind of, uh, actually one of those outreach uh, synthetic biology type of uh, propaganda machines. Uh, and the other one is in a drawing shows in Crown Book Academy in the United States. And it seems to bridge those gaps now. So we have like the two versions, basically two very s almost identical artworks yeah, but in totally different contexts. While you were talking, I was thinking about um, the new developments in information technology using uh, biological um, cells to store information because it's so much more efficient than uh, using technology to store mm. information, whether that's in the, your area or not. It's actually a really interesting, it's something I haven't talked about, but I'm working on it at the moment, uh, and that's a field, a new field which is referred to as metagenomics, where you take large chunks of whatever and isolate the DNA from that regardless of the specific organisms, uh, and, and looking at that, as, as, so basically an environment can be seen as a storage of information, of genetic information, but totally uh, decontextualized. So I have another talk, and I hope I'll be able to touch on it in this talk, but I didn't have the time, to talk about the whole notion of the decontextualization of life through those means of information-based approaches, um, which is something that I'm, I'm very interested. But, but to do with what you said, I, I recently went and visited a scientist who is engaged with uh, metagenomics and, and DNA sequencing. Uh, so basically reading the DNA, so either from environments or from bodies. Uh, and what they have now is that realize that it's actually cheaper to resequence your DNA, for example, as, as a human, than try and store it. Uh, so if before they would take DNA and, sequ and sequence it and read it and put it in computers to store it uh, as a way of trying to understand who you are, now they realize it's kind of this really lovely little kind of poetic justice piece where they're saying actually it's cheaper to keep it inside you and read it when we need it than try to store it on computers. Yeah. So, so it is, yeah, so, so there's, there's some poetic uh, uh, notions that are coming out of, of our obsession with information that uh, I think artists should engage with that because the, the scientists didn't really see the paradox in this whole story and how beautiful it was. 
uh, it, it, and it's funny that I'm using the word beautiful, but in this context, I think it's okay. Uh, so I, I think that what, what we see now is this appreciation that biological systems are working in ways which are, are different than how we thought about them before, but also the fact that our, our obsession with information-based uh, notion, and this is the, the Craig Venter approach, um, is extremely decontextualized. From, so it's, it's really about people, and that's going back also to quite a lot of what uh, my experiences with new media, uh, it's driven by people who don't like to remind it that they have a body. And we now have to constantly remind them that actually we have bodies which are irrational and messy and, and are more than just the sum of the information that they contain. It's interesting the question of paradoxes, which mm. is important to you and important to art. Like, how are, when you talk to the scientists that you work with, how do they cope with paradox? So I think science, and, and it's a huge generalization, but science, is, science seems to cope better with paradoxes than engineers, for example. So engineers, by definition, are, are there to, to try and resolve those paradoxes rather than to open them up so that they can't deal, especially when they're uh, kind of un unresolvable types of paradoxes. They, it's, you put them in loops and you see how kind of the smoke is coming out of their ears and they can't really engage with that very well. Uh, scientists tend to like it to a certain extent, as long as uh, they don't feel that it's jeopardizing what they're trying to do. So, you know, if you put them in a situation where it's not just a paradox, it's basically you highlight how uh, irrational the way they choose to engage with the scientific uh, uh, question is, while they consider the whole scientific project to be kind of, obviously, the project of the enlightenment and rational thought, and, and then you, you kind of highlight where it falls apart, uh, then you might have a problem, but they're more than willing to engage with this. Uh, but that takes quite a while. So in order to engage with scientists, uh, anyone, any artist here who's interested in doing it, it, it's a very slow dance of seduction. You don't jump into the deep issues when you just meet them. Yeah. It takes building up. There's lots of foreplay uh, that you need <laughs> to engage with before you can uh, raise those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any scientists in the audience, by the way? You're not willing to admit. Is it yeah. working with plant material? Uh, not me specifically, but uh, we have researchers at Sibiotica that have done it, and we actually now have a big resurgence in uh, uh, plant work because there's a growing body of research that talks about um, plant uh, signaling and, uh, and plant responsi responsiveness. So uh, we're starting to see more and more work that is being done in this field. Uh, so at the moment, as we speak, actually, we have two residents at Symbiotica, actually one PhD student, one resident, uh, are lo looking very deeply into that. Yeah. What about fungi? Fungi? Fungi, yeah. Like uh, fungi. Yes. So we had, as you've seen, the fungi dress that uh, we had, uh, Laura, uh, Donna Franklin, uh, but also fungi is uh, my enemy. Uh, <laughs> I'll just show you, Oops. okay, this is gonna, we had this uh, fungal infection of uh, one of our victimless leather jackets uh, in the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo. So it started very small and it ended up as that. So, but from becoming an enemy, it became an integral part of the work. So, but it was not something that I deliberately uh, introduced to the work. It's something that uh, kind of appeared and actually ended up making the work so much more interesting. Uh, but fungi is a, is a very interesting organism, or this selection of organisms. And it's quite unknown territory. It is, that's right, and it's quite unfamiliar, but uh, there's a growing interest. Uh, we haven't done much of that because uh, now we have a new lab that we can start to work with those types of organisms, but before, obviously, you don't really want to mix uh, animal tissues and fungi in the same room. So now we, we actually will be able to do it. So if you have any interest in doing fungi work, talk to me. Yeah. Let's join me in thanking Oron for that very provocative talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.